Hello and welcome to the Minimum Competence episode for Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. I'm your host for today, Andrew Leahy, a tax and technology attorney from New Jersey. On today's episode, a key ruling on litigation finance in New Jersey, upcoming judicial reforms in three states, Boyd Schiller's defense in a mortgage class action, and election-related lawsuits. Let's remember, there is something incredibly nostalgic and significant about the annual cascade of autumn leaves and read today's legal news. On this day in legal history, October 15, 1966, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was founded in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. Although primarily thought of as a political and social movement, its founding also had significant legal implications. The Black Panther Party was established to address systemic racism, police brutality, and economic inequality faced by black communities, particularly in the legal system and law enforcement practices. One of the key legal aspects of the Black Panther Party's activities was their use of California's open carry gun laws. Members of the party would patrol black neighborhoods while armed to monitor police interactions, invoking their constitutional right to bear arms. This practice was known as cop watching and sought to hold law enforcement accountable. The Panthers' visible use of firearms and legal knowledge led to heightened tensions between them and law enforcement, prompting legislative responses such as the Mulford Act in 1967, which was designed to outlaw the public carrying of loaded firearms in California and was supported by then-Governor Ronald Reagan. The Black Panther Party's actions brought attention to issues of police misconduct and unequal treatment of African Americans within the legal system, making October 15th a key date in both the civil rights movement and the history of legal rights advocacy in the U.S. In a boon to litigation financing in the Garden State, the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Division ruled that litigation finance deals do not constitute loans under state law, protecting the industry from claims that high interest rates violate lending regulations. The case originated from a traffic accident plaintiff who received $9,600 in funding from Covered Bridge Capital to support her litigation. After partially repaying the company and discharging the remaining debt in bankruptcy, she sued, alleging violations of consumer protection laws. The court dismissed her claim, stating she lacked standing as an aggrieved consumer, given that she financially benefited from the agreements. The panel referenced federal court precedent to classify litigation finance as contracts for recovery interests rather than traditional loans. Both plaintiff and defense attorneys acknowledged the significance of the ruling, with the defense celebrating the clarification of the legality of these deals, while the plaintiff's lawyer expressed concern over its impact on consumer fraud statutes. New Jersey lawmakers continue to debate potential regulations, including a 40% cap on interest rates for litigation finance deals. In the upcoming November election, voters in New Hampshire, Arizona, and Colorado will consider significant judicial reforms. New Hampshire's proposal, CACR 6, would raise the mandatory retirement age for judges from 70 to 75, allowing experienced judges to serve longer. This change has bipartisan support, with proponents arguing that judges often start later in life and the current retirement age cuts short their careers. Arizona voters will decide whether to eliminate judicial term limits and retention elections with Proposition 137. This move, driven by the state legislature, follows controversy over justices upholding an old abortion law, with opponents concerned about reduced voter oversight. Meanwhile, Colorado voters will determine whether to create a new judicial discipline board in response to a scandal involving the former chief justice. The amendment would transfer authority from the state Supreme Court to the board, aiming for more transparency in judicial misconduct cases. Each state's proposal reflects broader questions about judicial accountability and the balance between independence and oversight in the legal system. Questions that, at the federal level, have no answer coming in the foreseeable future. Boys Schiller Flexner is defending itself against allegations of collusion with a hedge fund in a class action lawsuit accusing United Wholesale Mortgage, or UWM, of conspiring with brokers to overcharge home buyers. UWM recently requested that the case be dismissed and the law firm sanctioned, claiming Boyd Schiller is working with hedge fund Hunterbrook Capital, which is shorting UWM stock. In response, Boyd Schiller denied any involvement with Hunterbrook stock trades or funding of the lawsuit, calling UWM's accusations a sideshow aimed at distracting from the case's core issues. The lawsuit filed in April stems from an investigation by Hunterbrook Press that raised concerns about UWM's practices. Boy Schiller acknowledged receiving data from the nonprofit Hunterbrook Foundation, but maintained full control over the case. UWM accuses the plaintiffs and the firm of attempting to damage its business and stock value, but Boy Schiller has dismissed these claims as unfounded. The case, SQV United Wholesale Mortgage LLC, continues in Michigan federal court. In the lead up to the 2024 U.S. presidential election, voters in various states are turning to the courts to address voter accessibility issues. Erica Warabeck, a Pennsylvania voter, successfully sued to ensure that voters are notified if mail-in ballots have errors after hers was rejected due to an incomplete date. Her case is one of nearly 100 election-related lawsuits in key battleground states like Arizona, Michigan, and Wisconsin. These lawsuits often focus on expanding or restricting voting rights. In Wisconsin, for example, voters with disabilities are seeking electronic ballot access. 
Some cases have seen partial victories, while others remain unresolved as courts navigate issues like polling place access, ballot marking, and voter registration. These legal battles highlight the ongoing tension between protecting voter access and ensuring election integrity, though it should be noted loud and often that in all elections, actual voter fraud is exceedingly rare. And with that, and as always, I thank you so much for listening to Minimum Competence, your daily news podcast for lawyers. If you're looking for more than Minimum Competence, links to further reading and all the topics touched on today are in the show notes. And reviews go a long way towards helping new listeners to find our show. If you have a moment, leave a rating or review on your podcast player. We'd sure appreciate it. And if you know someone that might be interested in a story we cover, consider sending them the episode. But remember, nothing here should be construed as legal advice because it is certainly not that. Minimum Competence is available at minimumcomp.com and wherever it is you get your finely crafted podcast. If you haven't checked out the website in a while, give it a look. There are complete transcripts and resources for each episode and its corresponding segments, as well as an opportunity to receive new episodes in email, newsletter, form. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And until then, remember... Yankees over Cleveland in game one. Let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, Metaphorically.